Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Wednesday's seminar. Um, I'd like to um, start by acknowledging the connection um, to the land that the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation have to the land that we're meeting um, here today to listen to Sam's PhD um, seminar. Um, and I'd like to um, acknowledge my respect for their elders, past, present, um, and emergent, emerging. Um, and of course, there's a lot of people watching from off-site, and I'd like to just encourage them to have a look into the history of the peoples and nations that have connections um, to the land on which you are watching this from. So today, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Samyukta Ramesh, who is giving her PhD completion seminar today. Um, I'd also like to extend a welcome to Sam's family, her uh, mother Shivana, father Ramesh, and sister, who's a surprise attendee, I think, uh, Vinny. Um, and it's really great to see um, that our PhD uh, students' family members are now able to come and watch um, in person. Um, so Sam's education has been split between Australia and India, um, with her high school um, being, being split between the, the two. Um, she did a bachelor's degree at Arna University in Chennai um, and an internship at Peter Mac. And of course, she's made the correct decision by coming to Wee High to do her PhD. <laughs> Um, so when Matt and I interviewed Sam, we were really struck by a very bright um, personality and a, and a real clarity of thought. So we pretty much decided on the spot to accept Sam um, into her lab. And um, I must admit, I even thought that um, she might have a calming influence on the lab that was um, made up of mainly Logos, Cyrus and Raph at the time. Um, but it turned out not to be the case because I have it on good authority that Sam's dark sense of humour is able to run rings around the likes of Cyrus, Raph and Shandy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so 2020 has not really been a walk in the park for pretty much anyone, and of course Sam is no exception. Um, faced with the long lockdown, she knocked out a review and made a start on um, writing her thesis. Um, and this has been quite the pleasure to read because she's an excellent um, writer and has a lovely turn of phrase. And I'm sure in the coming weeks she'll be able to um, finish her thesis into a nice polished document um, to, for us to send out. So like many students, Sam's project has changed a little bit. She started um, work on the T cell receptor when she arrived, but um, I think a lucky collaboration with Ed Hawkins and Phil Hodgkins led to her switching gears um, to study the B cell receptor and how that's built. And I think in hindsight that, that that was a very good thing because the cryo-EM structure of the T cell receptor that was published in 2019 I think would have been a hard blow. But luckily Sam has not been scooped um, and so she's going to tell us today about how the B cell receptor is constructed um, and in fact um, reveal that the uh, B cell receptor has a lot in common with the T cell receptor as well as um, other immune immunoreceptors. So with that I'd like to thank, invite Sam to the stage to give us her seminar. Thank you so much, Mel, for that lovely introduction. Um, very excited to share my PhD work with everyone here today. Um, and it's, as Mel mentioned, on the B cell antigen receptor. So the B cell antigen receptor is present on the surface of B cells and is critical for the B cells in sending it the signals that it needs to make critical fate determining decisions throughout its development. And these signals also influence the events of the adaptive um, immune response. And uh, the B cell receptor, although commonly thought of as an antibody that's tethered to the B cell membrane, is actually composed of um, two subunits. And um, these two subunits are the membrane-bound immunoglobulin, which um, is like a membrane-tethered antibody. And similar to an antibody, it's got um, heavy chains and light chains shown here in blue and orange. But as you can see, it doesn't have any substantial cytoplasmic domain for it to pass on the information that it receives into the B cell. And so for this, it associates with the signaling CD79AB heterodimer. And um, the CD79s have cytoplasmic tails that have tyrosines that can be phosphorylated to tap into various cellular signaling pathways to bring about the appropriate response. So in the case of um, when our cells uh, posed a threat like a bacterial or viral pathogen, for example, um, the antigens on these um, are recognized by the B cell receptor and the signal that 
um, is passed into the B cell enables it to differentiate and secrete antibodies. And these are basically a spliced form of the membrane-bound immunoglobulin that no longer has the transmembrane domain. And these antibodies can then neutralize um, the threat and um, provide us with the immunity that we need. And um, off late, this is a process that much of the general public has also become very familiar with, as it's the process that we're all relying on um, to give us long-lasting immunity against COVID once we take the vaccine. But this um, uh, segregation of function of um, antigen binding and signaling between two different subunits isn't just unique to the B cell receptor. There's actually a whole class of receptors that have this sort of modular arrangement. And while I don't expect you to read everything on this slide, it's just to show you that there are a large number of receptors that fall into this class, including receptors like the T cell receptor, B cell receptor, NK cell receptors, and FC receptors. And um, although these receptors are found in almost um, in most arms of our immune response, there's very little known about the um, mechanistic details of how they're able to pass the signaling information on um, through the membrane. And this is primarily due to the lack of structural information on these receptors. And um, this is because they are particularly challenging to study by traditional biophysical techniques like crystallography or NMR because of the presence of their transmembrane domains. And ironically, um, much of the interactions that actually hold the ligand binding and signaling subunits of these receptors together occurs in the transmembrane domains. And so my project specifically focus on, um, focuses on uh, f mapping these interactions that occur in the transmembrane domain of the B cell receptor. Um, in a non-traditional approach to tackle um, finding structural information about these receptors, our lab previously used a combination of biochemical and computational methods to map interactions in the transmembrane domain of the T cell receptor, which is the BCR's counterpart in T cells. And um, in the case of the T cell receptor, ligand recognition is accomplished by the central TCR alpha beta subunit. And um, the signaling is uh, performed by the three um, CD3 and Zeta Zeta dimers that this TCR associates with. And this association of the um, ligand sensing and signaling subunits in the TCR occurs through um, basic and acidic residues that are present in the transmembrane domain. And um, this coordination of um, basic and acidic residues uh, is a common model that's used by most of the receptors of the modular, modular activating receptor class. But in the case of the BCR, these basic residues are conspicuously absent in its transmembrane domain. So how exactly it um, associates with its signaling um, CD79AB dimer um, is a topic that's very poorly understood. So um, as I mentioned earlier, our lab used a combination of um, biochemical and computational techniques um, to map out the transmembrane interactions that occur in the, TCR, the central TCR alpha beta transmembrane subunit. And these, um, and these techniques included uh, cysteine scanning, NMR, and molecular dynamic simulations, which I will talk a bit more about through my talk. But um, through these combination of techniques, um, the lab was able to identify um, a unique interface that was forming between the TCR alpha and beta um, transmembrane domains. And this interface was stabilized by a network of hydrogen bonds um, uh, that a series of polar amino acids were um, responsible for, and these polar amino acids basically have OH groups that are capable of forming these hydrogen bonds that stabilize this bottom part of TCR alpha beta. And um, this model that was predicted by our lab um, was seen to be very accurate, um, as we saw in the TCR cryo-EM structure that was published about three years after our lab published this model. And um, the C alpha RMSD between um, the TCR alpha beta in our model and in the cryo EM structure was just 0.63 angstrom, and the RMSD is basically just a measure of the, similar, the structural similarity between any two structures, and 0.63 is very low. So this uh, publication of the cryo EM structure really helped to validate this combination of um, cysteine scanning and molecular dynamic simulations that um, generated this model that was um, so accurate in the context of the full um, T cell receptor. And uh, 
established it as a very effective um, combination of techniques to study other challenging membrane embedded proteins, which um, we discussed in a recent perspective article. And so we decided to use a similar combination of techniques to study um, the, B cell the B cell receptor whose assembly um, much less is uh, known about. So what's the current model of assembly in the B cell receptor? Um, so what, what's seen here is um, the transmembrane domain sequences of um, the BCR's membrane-bound immunoglobulin, as well as the CD79 A and B domains. And represented here is a web logo, which shows um, the level of conservation of each of these amino acids at each of these transmembrane um, positions. And the bigger the letter, the more conserved the amino acid at that position. And we can see that certain amino acids are highly conserved um, between all five BCR isotypes and across um, over 60 different species. And the prevailing model in the field is that these um, highly conserved residues fall on one side of a helix. And so this side of the helix was thought to be involved in interaction with CD79A and B, as this is a function that's common to BCRs of all five isotypes. And conversely, the other side of the helix um, was thought to be the isotype-specific side, which is responsible for oligomerization of the BCR um, during signaling. More specifically, um, two residues, um, these Y and S residues, um, were shown to be uh, key through mutagenesis experiments uh, to be key for interaction with CD79A and B, as mutations to remove these Y and S residues uh, to valines resulted in complete loss of CD79 association um, with the membrane-bound immunoglobulin. And so um, it was sort of, it became sort of entrenched in the field that these two were the two important residues in the transmembrane domain that were mediating interaction. And subsequent studies went on to show that this YV, YSVV mutation had um, defects in signaling and antigen presentation as well. But what we noticed when we um, lined up the BCR membrane immunoglobulin's transmembrane domain sequence with TCR alpha and beta's transmembrane domain sequence is that the Y and T residues that are involved in um, the hydrogen bonding network in TCR alpha beta are actually also present in a similarly spaced manner in the B cell receptor's mem uh, membrane-bound immunoglobulin sequence. And we thought maybe these Y and T residues, similarly to the case in TCR alpha beta, maybe they're involved in hydrogen bonding at um, the MIG-dimer interface rather than um, these residues being involved in association with um, the CD79s. And so testing this hypothesis was um, the primary goal of my PhD project. And so the main goals of my project were first to map out um, the transmembrane organization of the membrane-bound immunoglobulin dimer, and to then um, perform mutations um, at the key residues that were identified at the interface between um, this MIG dimer, and finally to be able to model um, the whole tetrameric transmembrane domain of um, the B cell receptor. And now you might wonder, um, you've shown us that they're helical as they pass through the membrane, so what do you mean you, you want to figure out the structure? So we know that single-pass um, mem uh, single membrane proteins typically traverse the membrane as a helix, but what we want to figure out is how these helices are packed with respect to each other. And so once we know um, this transmembrane organization of the B cell receptor, first of all, this will give us um, the first insights in, into the arrangement of um, the two components of the B cell receptor, um, which we currently don't know. We don't know how the MIG is oriented with respect to CD79AB. And um, knowing these interactions at a molecular level will really help us in understanding the earlier steps of um, B cell receptor signaling. Further, since the B cell receptor is so central in the adaptive immune response, um, no doubt targeting um, this, re this receptor is um, involved um, in cancers, autoimmune disorders, infectious diseases, um, if it's dysregulated. And um, being able to um, use, uh, there will be great therapeutic advantage in knowing exactly how it's um, arranged. And more specifically, um, knowing the exact transmembrane organization will help in a knowledge-backed way to engineer receptors like CARs or chimeric antigen receptors. And these are basically um, 
Frankenstein receptors that have bits and pieces of different immune receptors in them that are currently all the rage for treating cancer um, uh, for, as cancer immunotherapeutics at the moment. And um, so knowing the exact structural information will go a long way in being able to design these receptors. So starting off with the first goal of my PhD, which was to map the transmembrane dimer interface of the membrane-bound immunoglobulin, this involves um, two uh, main parts. So the first part is to use cysteine scanning to map the points of close packing between these two chains. And to do this, we first needed to be able to assemble the B-cell receptor in our in vitro uh, translation system, uh, which I will explain in just a second, and then to be able to identify um, cysteine crosslinks that are formed between the two chains, and then specifically identify those crosslinks that form within the, complex, within the context of a completely assembled B-cell receptor. Then these crosslinks can then be used as distance restraints for molecular dynamic simulations to model um, this MIG dimer. So starting off with um, the first part of this goal, uh, which is doing cysteine scanning in um, the membrane-bound immunoglobulins transmembrane domain. So cysteines are a unique amino acid in that if they're placed close enough to each other and in the right geometry, they're able to form a disulfide bond or a crosslink um, when oxidized. And so if we introduce cysteines into our protein of interest um, at different positions, um, only those positions that pack close to each other within the context of a fully assembled receptor will be able to form a crosslink. And um, when they're facing away, the crosslinks will not form. And this helps us in mapping uh, interfaces that lie close to each other in the fully assembled B cell receptor complex. And um, the system that we use for this is the in vitro translation system, which is a cell-free system of protein production. And this um, uses rabbit reticulocyte lysate, which um, helps in, which provides all the translation machinery required to make our protein of interest if we just provide the mRNA to code for it, as well as the amino acids um, to make it. And we specifically add in radio-labeled methionine and cysteine to be able to visualize our products at the end by autoradiography. This in vitro translation system can then be taken to the next level by the addition of um, our homemade endoplasmic reticulum microsomes. And these are particularly key while studying uh, membrane proteins as natively in a cell, membrane proteins are co-translated and assembled in the ER environment. So by the addition of these um, endoplasmic reticulum microsomes, we can ensure the most native-like assembly of our B cell receptor complexes. So once these complexes have assembled, we then add our oxidizing agent to um, enable the formation of crosslinks um, between our cysteine mutants. And this oxidizing agent, copper phenanthrolene, or QFE, has this bulky phenanthrolene moiety that traffics the copper to the intramembrane space and is able to catalyze our transmembrane crosslinks. These crosslinked complexes are then extracted using um, a mild detergent like digitonin and um, digitonin helps in preserving even non-covalent interactions. So when we do subsequent immunoprecipitations for particular chains of the B cell receptor complex, it will also um, co-immunoprecipitate even non-covalently associated species. So if we target the MIG, this will also bring down any associated CD79, AB, and vice versa. And these products of the immunoprecipitation are then analyzed by SDS page and autoradiography um, uh, to visualize the results in the end. And so we were successfully able to assemble the whole B cell receptor complex in our in vitro translation system, um, which was a first. It ha hasn't been done before in this system. And while we were able to assemble the whole complex, we did see quite a lot of um, misfolding occurring, presumably because of the sheer number of Ig domains that are present in the B cell receptor. And so what we decided to, to do was to use a truncated constru construct that has previously been uh, used by other groups, um, which is shown to retain wild type level association with CD79 AB. And when we used, um, and so we decided to try using this truncated construct to see if it retained the ability to associate with CD79 AB in our in vitro translation system. So we assembled um, the two of them together and we did an immunoprecipitation for total CD79 AB and compared the amount of um, full length versus truncated um, 
uh, Meg Dimer that was co-immunoprecipitated. And this is typically what the results of our in vitro translation experiments look like. And you can see here um, the, oops, CD79AB, which is the IP target. And you can see that there's a good amount of both full length and the truncated construct coming down with it, which um, validated that this truncated construct was perfectly good at forming a full complex with CD79AB. And so with this base construct, we then, um, introduced a couple of extra mutations to do our cysteine cross-linking. And this involved getting rid of the native cysteines in um, the, the MIG chains that are responsible for interchain disulfide bond formation, because we didn't want them to um, uh, form uh, dimers with, uh, with these cysteines that are present in the extracellular domain, any dimers that formed, we wanted them uh, to happen only in the cysteines we introduced in the transmembrane domain. So we mutated these um, extracellular interchain uh, disulfide bond forming cysteines to serines. Um, and just to clarify, the cysteines that are responsible for holding each Ig domain together, so that intrachain cysteines were left untouched. It's just the cysteines that are responsible for forming the dimer that were mutated to serines. And so on um, this cysteine-less background, we then generated all of our cysteine mutants. And um, we did the first immunoprecipitation strategy targeting um, the heavy chain. So all of the cysteine mutants were assembled with the CD79s and um, immunoprecipitated by the heavy chain. So as you can see here in the case of the wild type, um, we see predominantly heavy chain dimer is immunoprecipitated, while in the case of the cysteineless construct, it's predominantly monomer. And what we're looking for in all of our cysteine mutants is recovery of the dimeric heavy chain product, which indicates a crosslink formed in the transmembrane domain. And so we see that um, most of these um, positions are able to form a dimer through the cysteines we introduce in the transmembrane domain. And when we quantify um, the amount of heavy chain dimer that um, comes down in each immunoprecipitation with respect to the total amount of heavy chain um, immunoprecipitated, we see, and we plot this on a graph, we see that there's this very satisfying um, pattern of cross-linking strength where there's a peak every three to four residues. And what this means is that there's helical periodicity in um, the cross-links that we're seeing. And what this means is if we plot the strength of these crosslinks on a helix, the strongest ones almost fall along one side of the helix, um, suggesting that this side of the helix may be involved in um, any interactions at the interaction um, interface between the MIG dimer. And um, while this was good that we were able to catch crosslinks in um, most of these positions, we wanted to more specifically be able to select only the crosslinks that formed while um, in complex with CD79 A and B, because that would be the most physiological scenario. And so we did a further, string, uh, a further stringent IP strategy that involves targeting CD79 A and B, and this will bring down any species that are associated with CD79 A or B or the dimer and compare the amount of cross-linked um, heavy chain that comes down with the CD79s. And um, we see here um, that there's different amounts of the heavy chain that comes down in all of these uh, different cysteine mutants. And this already shows a selection for only some positions preferentially over the others that are able to form dimers and form um, uh, a working association with CD79AB. And so plotting the ratio of um, the dimer that comes down in these immunoprecipitations to the total amount of CD79AB and plotting this on a graph, we see that uh, some positions that initially um, formed strong dimers have now dropped out in this um, more uh, physiological IP selection, which already shows that we're selecting for um, more specific whole BCR complexes. And in the final more stringent selection strategy, we do a two-step IP, which involves first targeting one um, CD79A, washing off everything that's unbound, and then eluding everything that was bound in the first step, 
which we know will definitely contain CD79A, and then um, uh, binding the second um, immunoprecipitating agent against CD79B. And so this preferentially brings down only uh, CD79AB heterodimers and anything that associates with the CD79AB heterodimers. And um, as you can see, when we did these stringent IP strategies on um, the mutants we previ previously saw uh, form dimers and associate with CD79AB, we see here that, um, and we plot the dimer that comes down with respect to CD79AB, we see here where each dot represents um, the data from three separate experiments, we see that some positions, um, again, are preferentially selected that form strong dimers and associate well with CD79AB. And so we selected these three positions, which had the highest um, cross-linking strength and CD79 association to use as distance restraints for our molecular dynamic simulations. To, so to summarize this section, we were able to optimize a system to assemble our BCR um, using in vitro translation and um, optimize the IP strategies. We were then able um, to detect crosslinks and used um, increasingly stringent selection strategies to find only those crosslinks that form within um, a complete BCR complex. And now we have these crosslinks ready to help restrain our molecular dynamic simulations. So uh, going into part B of um, uh, establishing the MIG dimer model, uh, which is the molecular dynamic simulations. Um, shown here are uh, the three strong crosslinks that we used um, to restrain the simulations. And these simulations are done by our collaborators at Lehigh University, So Jung and Wong Pil. Um, and what this um, initial modeling involves is modeling the lipid bilayer as a hydrophobic slab and then putting our um, BCR monomers into this slab and using the distance restraints between the specific positions to bring them um, closer towards each other, but then they're allowed um, to then uh, undergo the molecular dynamics, which lets them shift around a bit so that they find their most energetically favorable conformation, and thousands of conformations are um, tested in this process, and it finds the most energetically feasible one in the membrane, and this most closely resembles um, the physiological structure, usually. So. Um, we were thus able to generate um, a model of uh, the BCR um, MIG homodimer. And um, shown here are the final distances between our restraints in the final model. And um, we see uh, very interestingly that the conserved residues that were previously proposed to interact with CD79AB are actually present exactly along this interface that our model identified. Um, and not facing outwards towards CD79AB as previously predicted. Further, we were able to see um, a hydrogen bonding network similar to that seen in the TCR at the lower portion of the BCR mixed transmembrane domain as well, um, with YT hydrogen bonding and additional serine-serine hydrogen bonding that um, stabilizes this interface. So we wanted to see if a similar structure um, compatible with this um, polar network was formed by the B cell receptor of all five isotypes. And so we did um, simulations again, but this time instead of using a hydrophobic slab, we used a more, um, uh, a more accurate uh, mim mimetic of the lipid bilayer, which is using POPC lipids um, with atomistic detail. And we let our models from the first round of modeling um, equilibrate unrestrained in these POPC bilayers. And um, this provides uh, a more accurate picture of exactly how all the side chains of our model are oriented in a lipidic environment. And we see that all five isotypes of the BCR adopted um, similar conformations um, uh, by these um, simulations as well. And all of these isotypes are compatible with this um, hydrogen bonding network, stabilizing them at, um, in the lower half. 
So taking a closer look into this hydrogen bonding network and comparing it with what was seen in the TCR, we see that just like in the TCR, there's YT hydrogen bonds in um, both these cases. But in the case of BCR, since it's a dimer, it's got two of these hydrogen bonds, so it's doubly reinforcing. And while the T cell receptor has um, an N backbone carbonyl hydrogen bond, the B cell receptor has two additional serine-serine hydrogen bonds, which may be further stabilizing its interface. But since there was this common YT hydrogen bonding occurring in both the BCR and the TCR, um, this was quite interesting and something that hadn't really been pointed out in the literature before. And so we decided to take a bit of a deeper dive into this um, motif with the Y and T residues. So this y t YXXXXT, where X, Xs just mean um, they could be any, any four amino acids in the intervening positions between the Y and T. We see that in the case of the BCR, this is present on both sides of the dimer and um, really helps in stapling the complex together. And we did a search for this YX4T motif amongst um, all immune proteins, actually all single pass trans uh, transmembrane domain containing proteins. And um, I've just highlighted a few of them here where they've been shown to be key dri drivers of dimerization in these proteins. And um, these proteins, including the Zeta Zeta, which is one of the TCR's signaling dimers, and CD28 and CTLA4, which are also key um, immune proteins in the TCR, and FC receptor gamma. On all of these systems, this YT motif has been shown um, to be crucial to stability and um, to drive dimerization. And yeah, that was a pretty cool motif that's also, we've also found it in um, multiple other proteins, but these are relatively less well characterized, so it will be interesting to see if they also turn out to be dimeric. So to summarize this section, um, we were able um, to model the MIG dimer um, interface using the crosslinks that we obtained from our cysteine crosslinking. And this showed that the conserved residues previously thought to be involved in CD79 association are actually involved in mediating this um, dimer interface in the membrane-bound immunoglobulin. Further, we see that um, a common um, hydrogen bonding element, uh, structural element, is present in both the BCR and the TCR. And this was um, not previously appreciated or noticed. And um, this is very cool considering um, up to now, the field didn't think that there were any similarities in the transmembrane organization of the TCR and the BCR. And further, um, this has identified another system that uses the YX4T um, motif um, to promote uh, dimerization and stabilization of a transmembrane dimer interface, which um, is also seen in other immune proteins. So that takes me to my, the second goal of my PhD, which, is, um, which was to mutate these key residues that we identified at the interface and test their effect on um, stability of the BCR complex. So to do this, um, we selected mutations that only remove the hydrogen bonding OH groups from um, these residues that are involved in the polar network. And so specifically, that serine to alanine um, tyrosine to phenylalanine and threonine to valine mutations. And as you can see here, the amino acid substitutions that are made preserve the size and um, shape of the amino acid with just the OH group removed. And so we introduced these um, mutations in all possible combinations uh, at these four positions and um, assembled these uh, mutants with CD79AB and monitored how these um, mutations in the polar network affected assembly with CD79AB. And so starting off with um, the Y and S residues that um, were previously predicted to be important CD79 contacts, um, what you see here is um, how well each of these mutants are able to um, associate with CD79 um, and they're normalized to wild type, which is shown, um, yeah, which is uh, which is shown by the dotted line. And um, you can see that mutation of Y to F um, results in a loss of CD79 association, which um, 
is in line with previous literature, but we can see that mutation of the S605 has no effect on um, association of CD79AB. And this um, straight off the bat says that S is not a necessary CD79 contact. Further, and probably the most um, interesting observation, is that when um, we mutated the OH groups of the Y and T together, this results in restoring um, CD79 association back to wild type levels. And this indicates that the Y and T are acting as a pair as by itself, just removing um, the, hyd the, hyd the hydroxyl group from one of the H bonding pair leaves the other one unpaired and it destabilizes the interface. But mutating Y and T both together results in um, uh, a rescuing of CD79 association back to wild type levels. And so now we also know that Y is not a necessary um, CD79 contact. So basically both of the residues previously proposed to be necessary for CD79 association are not actually necessary for CD79 association. And this is presumably because um, of compensation by the other hydrogen bonding networks that helps that help in maintaining the stability of the complex. Um, so next we uh, checked the effects of mutation of the two serine-serine hydrogen bonds. And we see that they both have um, unequal importance at this interface as mutation of S605 doesn't have um, any major effect, but mutation of S601 um, results in a drop in CD79 association, probably because S601 is responsible for holding the upper part of this dimer together while the YT um, would be holding the lower part of the dimer together. And finally, when we mutate um, all four residues of um, the polar network, we see um, a, a noticeable drop in CD79 association, but really the most disruptive um, mutation was the mutation of the Y604 and S601. And what this shows is that while um, each of the hydrogen bonds are important for the stabilization, having an unpaired hydrogen bonding partner is just as disruptive. And so a combination of losing hydrogen bonding um, between a pair of residues or leaving an unpaired residues, and oh yeah, a combination of these two results in the most um, disruptive phenotype and the most marked loss of CD79AB association. And this really shows the complexity of um, this polar network in the BCR, where um, different hydrogen bonds are able to be broken and reformed or compensate for each other to m try to maintain the stability um, of this complex. So to summarize this section, um, we've uh, uh, shown here that the Y and S residues previously thought to be CD79 contacts are actually not necessary for CD79 association. And we see that Y and T um, act as a pair, um, suggesting that they are involved in, um, hyd in hydrogen bonds with each other. And further, um, we see that there are multiple hydrogen bonds in this network that um, uh, work in a compensatory fashion um, to uh, rescue the receptor if any one of these hydrogen bonds is broken. And this level of complexity was not previously appreciated with the model that just suggested two residues sticking out of the MIG dimer that directly contact the CD79AB. And this extensive mutational work has um, shown that it might actually be a different mechanism of um, stabilization of the complex than what was previously thought. So um, that takes me to the last goal of my PhD, which um, I won't be going into in too much detail because um, this is a work in progress and this is to model the whole um, tetrameric um, BCR transmembrane domain. Um, and so to do this, we extended our cysteine scan um, to between the heavy chain and CD79A as well as the heavy chain and CD79B. And we've been successful in obtaining crosslinks um, between all four of these chains. 
And these crosslinks were then used to restrain molecular dynamics simulations as we previously did for the MIG dimer. And we have some preliminary models um, that are quite exciting and we're looking into now, but um, pending some confirmatory experiments, so I haven't put them into my talk today. But it um, will be quite exciting to have that first structural look at the whole transmembrane arrangement of the B cell receptor in the very near future. And so uh, I'd like to summarize my talk um, today. Um, and what we were able to do was to generate uh, a model of the membrane-bound immunoglobulin transmembrane dimer. And this was the first structural um, look into the transmembrane packing of the B cell receptor. And it was made possible by this combination of biochemical and computational methods. Um, we've identified um, a structural element between um, the two, uh, the B cell receptor and the T cell receptor, which was um, previously not um, uh, noted in the literature. And in, well, it's just like really cool and it's <laughs> completely unexpected. <laughs> and um, while these receptors have completely different um, mechanisms of ligand like, sensing and transmembrane organization and the number of signaling subunits, and with the BCR lacking those basic residues that um, coordinate assembly, it was really cool to be able to find this conserved structural element between um, the two receptors. Um, further, we were able to identify um, the. Oh, I'm off by one. Um, we were able to identify the um, YXXT motif that. Um, YX4T motif that was um, key for maintaining the stability of the B cell receptor complex and we've since used for, um, has uh, and since been used in our lab for actually um, enhancing the design of um, chimeric antigen receptors um, by Nick Chandler in our lab. And so there's been a direct utility for that uh, motif already and I'm uh, sure this motif might also be present in other immune receptors that we will um, come to find out uh, in the future. And um, finally, um, uh, what we've shown through a combination of um, our model and our polar network mutation data is that um, uh, yeah, we've been able to show that there's actually possibly a different mechanism of assembly of the B cell, recep uh, of the B cell receptor than was um, previously thought as the conserved phase that was thought to mediate interaction with um, the CD79s um, is actually involved in um, stabilizing the MIG dimer interface. And um, it's not a direct uh, couple of residues that are facing the CD79s that mediate this assembly, but rather a complex network of polar interactions that are responsible for um, mediating this uh, interaction. Um, and with that, I'd like to go uh, acknowledge everyone that um, helped uh, with this work. And first and foremost, um, my supervisors, Matt and Melissa, who are extremely generous with um, their time and their um, suggestions and are so invested in my experiments, which I'm really thankful for. Um, and a lot of people always ask, they'll be like, how, does, how is it working for um, a couple? Like, that must be pretty stressful. And um, quite on the contrary, they're very, um, they're just very um, uh, <laughs> respectful and um, What's the word? <laughs> They're just like really respectful and sensible um, with their um, opinions and how they put them out. And whenever I have, um, whenever I go to them with a problem, rather than getting one solution, I end up getting two, which um, Mel usually follows up with a cheeky, so Sam, whose advice are you going to follow? <laughs> um, and of course, the right answer to that is I'm going to try both, <laughs> um, which. Um, which is just great because we all know that the first um, solution that we try to take to solve a problem in science pretty much never works. So I appreciated having the two <laughs> options. Um, <laughs> um, and I'd also like to thank, uh, I'd next like to thank uh, Nick Chandler, who's um, pretty much done his PhD alongside me. And it's been great to have um, someone there in the lab um, who you can 
prank. I mean, um, <laughs> you can have to discuss your exciting new experimental results with, um, and equally to discuss the experiments that go horrendously wrong. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone in the call lab for just their generosity with their time, their feedback, um, and just the good vibes. And I really appreciate um, all of you. Um, I'd also like to thank um, some of the past members of the call lab who've um, helped with the project and Logos in particular for doing the work on the TCR Alpha Beta uh, model, which really paved the way for my project. Um, I'd also um, like to thank our modeling collaborators, Su Hyung and Wang Pil, um, for doing such a stellar job. They've always got about 50 collaborations going on with um, biologists, but they're always um, so prompt with their um, communication and um, so easy to talk to and very um, glad to have them to help with the modeling aspect of my project. Um, I'd like to thank the Gulbis Lab for their generosity with some reagents, which for some of the experiments that I didn't talk about today when I had to cast my own gels, so thank you, Jackie's lab. Um, I'd also like to thank my um, PhD committee for all of their um, amazing feedback through my committee meetings and giving me new insights into my project that I wouldn't have otherwise thought to follow. Um, I'd also like to thank um, uh, the Structural Biology Division in general, which is just such a wonderfully friendly atmosphere um, and just so abundant in expertise. I'm very thankful to be part of um, the division and specifically um, to Amanda, um, who keeps everything running smoothly. Thank you for minuting my meetings and for always saying something encouraging at the end of my um, meetings. Uh, it's always nice to hear after you've had um, a milestone meeting. Um, I'd also like to thank Peter and Matt for giving me the opportunity to present my work at um, this Wednesday forum. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity and also to Peter for actually introducing me to the calls in the first place when I reached out to do my PhD um, with Peter's lab and he was like, oh, I can actually introduce you to someone else who's actually got um, a position you might be interested in. So thank you for um, introducing me to Matt and Mel. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Sue and Keeley from the Education Office, um, probably the sole reason I'm still enrolled in the university, considering the pretty crazy communication systems. Um, I really thank you for keeping on top of everything and keeping us students on top of everything um, so that we don't miss any of the important university announcements. Um, I'd also like to thank... Um, um, Sorry, my screen's just blacked out. <laughs> oh, sorry, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, finally, I'd like to thank um, Ed, Phil, and Lynn for um, a, a collaboration that really started off my um, switching to the B cell receptor project, as, Ma as Mel mentioned in um, my in my introduction. And um, yeah, I'm really thankful to them because I jumped ship up from the TCR at the right time. Um, before the cry VM structure would have come out and scooped me. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank the funding sources that um, supported uh, me and my work over the last um, four years. And I'd, of course, like to thank um, all my family and friends um, who've been so important over the last four years and WeHi for providing the um, environment that's really helped um, in giving me the opportunity, so many opportunities to... Um, form friendships and it's, it's so much harder when um, you come from, you've done your school and uni somewhere else and you're new to um, the city and they just give you so many opportunities and groups to be part of so that you can form those support networks that are so crucial um, in the marathon that is the PhD. So I'm very thankful for um, the dumplings, the pubs, the WESA events, um, um, the WESA committee that I was part of, which was absolutely lit, and like all of the um, all of the events that we're um, allowed to help organize, all of our lab get-togethers, um, 
it, it's just been such a great time. My brief stint with the footy, brief my opportunity to sing with the band. Um, there's just been like so many memories and I'm really bad at um, taking photos, so I don't have photos. And if you're not on this slide, I'm still thinking of you during my acknowledgements. I thank everyone who um, I've had a chat to at the pub or has stopped to have a chat to me in the tea room. Um, I promise you it's made the biggest um, difference in my day and I really appreciate it. Um, last but not least, I'd like to thank um, my family uh, who've just been unwavering pillars of support um, through all of this and they've got that weekend getaway holiday home kind of um, outlet for me on the weekends to have a bit of a mini break and really let out my crazy side because yeah, I'm quite a menace at home. Thanks for um, putting up with that and also like, actually nourishing that side of me. And um, thank you to all the food and baked goods that um, have helped me like through the whole time that you've been here. Um, and I'd also like to thank my best friend back at home who um, I run through my 300 international minutes with in about one sitting quite routinely um, for her support through all of this. Um, and yeah, thanks, I'm happy to open to questions. Thanks, um, Sam, for your um, for your seminar. It was incredibly lit. Andy <laughs> 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 <Andrea> is <laughs> shaking his head. <laughs> um, do we have any questions from the auditorium? There's someone Slido. Um, With those transmembrane dimers, all the renders look, make them look very stiff. Are they as stiff as that kind of impression or do they flex inside the membrane? Um, so there is uh, quite a bit of flexibility um, dynamics in the membrane. Um, so normally the any other possible orientations they might take won't deviate too much from the model that we see that th there might be slight moving around um, uh, slight dynamics in the mem membrane and like we can see this in our cross-linking experiments as well as um, we were able to capture cross-links between quite a few positions that aren't really compatible with the whole um, BCR complex formation but form nonetheless during these um, dynamics and usually when um, once all the components of a protein have assembled together, this somewhat limits the dynamics a little bit more because certain interfaces are um, uh, stabilized by the connections that they make. So there is um, a little bit of dynamics in the membrane. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just ask one from the... Um, from Slido. Um, so Shabi has asked a question. Um, have you performed evolutionary coupling analysis, which I assume is where you look at residues that are conserved between species to show that they're coupled. Um, well, between the IG and CD79A. Um, so between the MIG and CD79A and B, um, the BCR and TCR transmembrane domains. Will this help with MD stimulation, uh, simulations as additional constraints? Uh, so... Oh, right, okay, I see what you mean. Um, so, so asking about residues that may have co-evolved together, so they might, may be involved in interaction. Um, I am actually not aware of, um, yeah, no, I haven't done this analysis and I'm not sure if it exists because it definitely hasn't been spoken about in um, the papers that I've read. There's one paper that has done a separate evolutionary conservation analysis of um, the BCR's membrane-bound immunoglobulin transmembrane domain. And this paper showed that the residues that are involved in um, some of those key interface, though some of those key interface residues are actually strongly negatively selected against. So through evolution, they are conserved because they don't want their sequences to change, but I don't, I haven't seen a paper talking about um, the co-evolution of the mix with the CD79s, and that would be definitely very interesting to look into if I find one. 
great seminar, Sam. So the FXT motif that you found, is that conserved only in immunological receptors? Do you see it in like cytokine receptors or other dimerization receptors? And is it predictive? Like do you, if you see that, do you know you're going to get a dimer or is it possible to be involved in a trimer or some other oligo? It's a very good question. Um, so we did do that extensive search on basically all single pass type 1 membrane proteins and we did get about like 10 other proteins that popped up in that search. Um, but they're all so poorly characterized, so we don't know whether they're monomers or dimers or what they are. And some of them are like so poorly characterized in that they're only documented as a product of a certain gene with basically no other functional characterization of the proteins. Um, so it will be interesting to see in the future if those do end up being dimeric or um, trimeric or um, there are examples. So the, the couple of immune receptors that I showed in my talk, um, those ones, there have been specific papers targeting the Y and T residues and mutating them. And they've really been shown to drive dimerization in those protein systems. But uh, there's just the one FC receptor gamma system, FC epsilon receptor gamma, in which um, there's an interesting, once, once the dimer associates with its um, receptor, one of those YT uh, networks on one side opens up to incorporate uh, an incoming residue from the receptor that it binds. So in that way, it's able to form like a sort of dimeric, um, sorry, trimeric interface. So I think there is scope for that, especially with hydrogen bonding. They're so easy to break and remake. I think there's definitely scope for a trimer also, and it'll be interesting to see if those other proteins end up being dimers or trimers. Um, Andreas asks, um, RIF states that BCRs are aggregated in unstimulated B cells, and ligation by antigen drives BCRs apart to activate signaling. How does your work inform on this? That's a very good question. And while I didn't go into too much um, detail about the um, mechanisms of uh, triggering in the BCR, so there's two main mechanisms, and one says that physically bringing BCRs together causes signaling, and the other one says BCRs are all pre-clustered into oligomers to begin with, and then the ligand actually moves them away from each other to cause the signaling. And so this um, work that Andreas is talking about is about this oligomerization being disrupted model. And um, I think uh, there is definitely scripts, especially once we um, figure out the structure of the whole tetrameric arrangement, I think this will really help us to see which surfaces in that tetramer are accessible for oligomerization and to be able to see if these could be um, facing each other to promote this oligomerization. I think this particular um, hydrogen bonding network that we've seen here um, will be intrinsic to a single BCR complex. I don't think this will be involved in interactions with a neighboring complex, but um, I think having the level of structural detail that we can get from um, these studies on the interactions in the transmembrane domain will definitely help in providing um, a more concrete structural basis for these um, models of triggering. So yeah, hopefully the full tetraba model will provide some answers. Great job, Sam. <clears throat> I think it's hard to understand how much work you've done just when you flash up those radio label blocks, <laughs> but I've seen you do it so much, and so did Logos. Um, when you say tetramer, uh, how sure are you that it forms a tetramer? Obviously, the dimer interface that you've modelled, it seems feasible that you could have two of the, of the um, CD79s coming in and interacting with one B cell receptor dimer. Um, is that possible or have you done modelling that sort of suggests not that is happening? Um, and also the mutants that you made that you changing the important residues, the YT, is that to do with the stability of the whole molecule and therefore you don't see pull downs or is it actually a bona fide interaction with the CD79? Uh, both very good questions. Um, I might answer your second question first. Um, so I do think that it's directly a result of loss of 
stability of the MIG dimer that influences um, the dissociation of the CD79s. I think, um, yeah, it, it's hard to pick apart in our assay whether the loss of CD79 association is due to um, a lack of a residue that's pointing outwards directly to CD79, which it needs to associate, or a um, destabilization of the complex, which inherently prevents them from associating. But by being able to do the mutations in like that kind of pairwise, and actually we did it in all possible confirmations, we're able to see the patterns that suggest that some of them are acting together as a pair, which suggests that they may be involved in hydrogen bonding with each other and was the basis for um, our mechanism of how it's stabilizing um, the interface. Uh, and coming back to your first question, which was how do you know that two CD79s couldn't um, associate with the MIG? Um, so there have been quite a few studies um, before this that have pretty much um, established the stoichiometry to be one-to-one. -one. So there's a fret, there's fret based um, there was a FRET-based study that showed it as well as um, a Blue Native Page study that um, showed that it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. But as you um, suggested, I think that it's possible that the other side of the MIG may be involved in an oligomerization interface. And if that oligomerization interface involves CD79, uh, another CD79 binding on the other side, but which in turn will be associated with its own MIG, um, if it, yeah, it, 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 the other side of the interface could very well, yeah, bind another CD79 in that sense to maybe promote oligomerization. Thanks. Um, I'm going to just ask one more question because we're um, just after two at the moment, um, and I'm going to combine Jake C's questions. Um, he's he's interested in how um, different lipids such as POPC, POPE, or cholesterol um, could change the dimerization interface or perhaps the tilt of the angles, and um, would you like to comment on that? That's a very um, interesting question um, and something we sort of uh, scratched the surface off a little bit. Um, so I think, so in some of our modeling, we have seen that um, the width of the membrane that we model um, has an impact on the structure that the dimer takes in the membrane. So um, when we enforce certain crosslinks while doing the modeling in a 30 angstrom versus a 34 angstrom membrane, we see a slight shift in um, the structure, the final structure that's formed. And this change in membrane thickness is also like typical of like some parts of the plasma membrane that may be in a lipid raft arrangement, which are typically um, broader than um, the regular cell membrane kind of environment. And I think these um, lipids, the POPC and POPE, they, they've all got different um, length alkyl groups. And I think these will be able to mimic membranes of um, different thicknesses. And it might help in providing um, some insight for sure, especially because the field also um, uh, thinks that maybe the BCRs may be uh, translocating into lipid rafts during signaling. and so these different sized lipids that mimic different sized um, membrane environments might actually be useful in picking apart these differences in the conformation as the BCR um, passes through its steps in signaling. So, yep. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Um, I'd like to close the um, seminar and, um, uh, and we should all give um, Sam a uh, real and virtual round of applause for um, completing her um, PhD completion seminar.